record and it's recording. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. And as I just mentioned, first and foremost, today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about on the drawing side of things. So in parallel with you um, laser cutting and assembling your final uh, physical prototype of your grid shell with componentry on top, um, we're gonna talk today about the representation, the drawing part uh, of this. Um, and uh, we'll build the uh, template and illustrator together in class today. And that way we, we do a little bit of illustrator refreshing, um, sort of remind you of some of the, the ins and outs and nuances of illustrator, All right? So first and foremost, I'm just gonna go to illustrator and new, create a new artboard or new document. Um, here's a bunch of presets, 24 by 18, eight and a half by 11, 11 by 17, 11 and a half by 14, whatever. You know, tabloid, legal letter, the, the usual. A2, A4, whatever, if you're doing metric. I'm gonna keep it in imperial inches, 24 inches by 24 inches, I'm gonna make a square. Um, color mode, I'm not so, I'll just leave it at CMYK in case you ever wanted to print these out. Um, raster effects, I'll go with 300 PPI and I'll just go ahead and hit create. So um, most of this stuff is default. Really what I'm just double checking is the size. I'm gonna make a 24 inch by 24 inch square document. All right, <clears throat> first thing I always do is I go to view pull down and I turn on the rulers. Rulers are so helpful. You'll notice that the rulers in the X direction start counting from that top, counting down from zero in that top, uh, top left hand corner and same thing in Y, right? So, um, you know, that zero, zero point in Illustrator is at that top left hand corner. And that really comes in handy later on when we're trying to align drawings and, uh, and guides and things like that. Um, just as a reminder, I can click and hold and drag from any of these rulers, let's say the vertical ruler along the, the left-hand edge, and I can place guides in a variety of places here. I'm just gonna try to snap it to the, the ruler, the horizontal ruler up the top in two inch increments. And I might be really successful. I'm kind of not really taking my time. One of the other things I can do is I can always select the guide. And let me just move this away a bit. I can always look at the, the uh, X and Y position. And the X position says 1.991, two inches. I want it to be exactly at that two inch mark. So I can go ahead and hit two. Select this one. Yeah, turn that to four. I was off by like a 100 thousandth of an inch each time or something. And you know, even if that's negligible, it still bugs the crap out of me, I don't know. It's like, why can't you just snap to like, I don't know, the ruler, illustrator, but whatever. <sighs> never can, never easy sometimes, 12, yeah. I'll just, so again, I'm just sort of clicking and dragging and I'm gonna place some, um, you know, you don't have to be too granular here. I'm just gonna do this in um, two inch increments or you can do it three inch increments, you know, 24 is divisible by two, of course. Right. I always, always set up a grid. It's like the first thing I do, pretty much any design problem, whether it's a building or whether it's just a freaking poster. All right, 18, we're almost there. 18, 20, and 22. And again, I'm just gonna ever so slightly make sure that these are precisely where I want them to be. A little bit of upfront work saves me a lot of work later on uh, in the future when I have lots of things populating this poster. I could do the same thing here as well. I'm not gonna go through and um, keyboard each one here, but you get the idea. I will before I give you this template, but um, you know, the key thing is that you're always keeping things lined up with this grid, right? I mean, that's, I mean, that's just like the first rule of Fight Club. Right. It's also the second rule of Fight Club. First rule of laying something out, follow the grid. Second rule, follow the grid, right? Um, and on and on and on. There's eight rules. Six of them are follow the grid. Just seeing if you guys are paying attention on a Monday, which by the way, I mean, man, winter is here, right? I mean, come on, good grief. It is flipping cold outside. And it blew away half of our Halloween stuff outside in our yard, like down the street. It was pretty sad. Anyway, okie dokie. All right, so we have a template. <clears throat> um, and as a reminder, you know, again, we have, we have the tools over on the left-hand side, you know, just like any Adobe software. 
Um, we have a set of boxes that we can toggle on or off for things like colors um, and uh, stroke, line weights, stroke types, etc. cetera. Um, layers, that's a really important one. Um, we have some transform tools where we can stretch and scale, position precisely, um, align and distribute things, um, et cetera. So um, again, just like any other Adobe software, so hopefully you guys hit that up between 267 and, uh, and second year studio, second year spring studio maybe. Um, you guys are probably illustrator experts. Surpass my knowledge pretty quickly. Anyway, so <clears throat> I just now noticed I have a couple of chats. Let's see. Yeah, it feels like we woke up in winter time. Sure it did. It's like someone flipped a switch. Yeah, it's 41 this morning. Absolutely terrible. What happened? I mean, come on. I was complaining about triple digits all the way until like October, but geez, like I wanted just a little bit of autumn. Gosh, did they get snow up in the mountains? Was there any precipitation? Because if so, that had to have been like a foot of snow. Anyway, which I have a sled somewhere in the garage I can get dig out. I haven't yet used it. <laughs> all right. So um, anyway, back to this. I've opened up Rhino. And so you can see that uh, previously, um, you know, I was thinking about this, right? You can sort of see where I'm going here. <clears throat> Just sort of take the grid shell construct, the structure, right? The two-way structure and the components themselves and explode them upwards. And so what we're doing is we're primarily doing a vertical drawing. We'll annotate it with labels. And then we'll also have a catalog of components along the side. Um, in order to sort of better display and show um, what's going on here, including a false color map um, of your, uh, of your um, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, what do you say, um, the, the solar study, the solar um, uh, analysis, right? So all that stuff that you guys have been generating up to now, the fabrication information, the digital model, the, the 3D model, all the flattened laser cutter information, which is the catalog of components, and then, um, and then the, uh, the, the coloring the mesh with the solar uh, radiation analysis, um, that all makes it in here, right? So it's, it's not all for, for nothing. Um, in fact, it's, it's all gonna be useful. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanna, again, remind you that if you've just been coming to class and just keeping up and doing things as following along, then um, you, you, shouldn't, you should feel like you're right there ready to, to put the, most of this together without too much work. Um, and again, I always think, you know, work smarter, not harder. So, you know, anytime you can follow along in class or just, or just um, spend an hour after class doing what we did in class afterwards, um, you know, you just sort of keep things going. Um, and then you're not faced with trying to remember back, what did we talk about last week when this, you know, when we talked about what I'm doing right now, the Sunday night before it's due and everything. So, all right. <clears throat> so back to... Rhino. I'm going to go ahead and expand this out a little bit so it's a little larger. And I'm just going to open up, um, I'm going to try to open up. Here we go. Open up exploded axon test. Here we go. Yeah, look at that. And I'm going to open up the grasshopper file actually. Oh, this said exploded axon test. I'm actually going to open up a different file. I haven't pulled it out as a, an axon yet. Um, as soon as Grasshopper loads, which I have so many plugins now, it's kind of ridiculous how long it takes. All right. Open. I'm going to look at the, uh, the recent. There we go. Um, fab test. That, that looks good. Why not? Sure. And I'm going to go to my recent files here. But basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to unload shading components. Maybe that's one. Fabrication layout example. I don't know which one I'll use. Let's see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So I'm using a slightly different surface than you guys are, just as a reminder. And what I wanted to do is just pull these open in Grasshopper and bake certain things out again. Um, you know, I think that's pretty important just to, again, to sort of show where these come in, remind you where these are coming from. Set one surface. There we go. So I create that surface. And 15 by 15 is what I have said here. And I just wanna double check and make sure that that aligns with how I had these divided up in my Rhino script. Yeah, just double check and make sure it was 15 by 15 that I had. Boy, that sure looks nice. So um, I, think, I think I'm on the right track there. 
Okay, right yo. All right, so Re you'll remember this is the the file, the grasshopper file where I'm taking and creating these solar components, right? The shading components, and then I'm joining them, trying to lay them out flat by unrolling them, um, putting them in a grid so that they're nice and ordered, and uh, and then even just extracting the outline. So I just have the fabrication information, and not these crazy ugly shade, red shaded uh, surfaces, but I just have quite literally um, the out, outside through cuts and the inside um, score cuts, right? Okie dokie, all righty then. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm just gonna create a couple of new layers here. I'll call this um, component grid cutting, and I'll name this one component grid scoring or something like that. Um, but that's important just because I'm gonna go ahead and bake some of this stuff out. So there's these laid out flat components in a grid. I'm gonna go ahead and right click and lay these out. Let's see, so um, bake. And then bake that one in the comp component grid cutting. That's the outside and then I'll, I'll do the, uh, the inside. You guys have already done this mostly for your laser cutting, right? Or you're going to. But in this case, what I'm doing is I'm just going through and I'm, I'm taking a copy of this file and I'm rebaking things in for the pretty graphics, all right? So for the poster, for the, the communication, the visual communication. So in this case, I'm gonna, um, uh, let's see, I'll go ahead and bake these out into the scoring, um, the scoring layer. And again, these aren't laid out for laser cutting. These aren't in, in, within an 18 by 24. These are in a nice just grid. Um, and so I, I'm just gonna leave them as such. And then last, I'm also gonna, gonna take that tags, these tags, I'll bake those into the scoring layer as well. Why not? Okie dokie, all right. I can turn that off now. Yeah, all right. Okay. And so, You know, just through baking, right, and running my Rhino script, I have my three-dimensional ribs. I have, let's see, my shading components. I now have the flattened versions, which I think is really important, laid out nicely, right? Um, so here are my, my uh, shading components laid out nicely. I'm sure I've done this before. Yeah, here we go. I have my ribs over here. These were for my, lay, my layout for laser cutting. Yeah, so good, oh yeah. This would have taken me three 18 by 24 sheets somehow. I don't know, all right. So I'm just gonna turn things off selectively here. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off these scored things I just created. They're important, don't get me wrong, but, but I'm gonna start with these these ribs. So let's start with the exploded axon first, okay? All right, so go to perspective. If I turn on my, my ribs, let's see, four stri V strips and U strips and my cell panels, right? So let's say I turn on the, the sort of three-dimensional representation of my grid shell, right? Mine looks more like a Pringle than yours probably does, but you know, that's okay. All right, there's a couple of things here. One is that which is best to use? My draft model didn't print the labels. Oh, but that's, that's tough when it doesn't do that. Um, you know, I would use like Arial or something like that. You know, don't, don't uh, get too, um, too crazy with fonts or anything, right? Um, it's a good question, Elizabeth. And you know, if it might be that they just weren't exploded to curves, in which case just select all text objects and just hit explode. And, uh, and then they'll explode them to curves. That might be one of the issues why it didn't go, but I can always take a look at your file at the end of class today if you'd like, Elizabeth, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm gonna move ahead, but keep interrupting me with questions as they pop up, because it's good. We can always go back through this list, even if it's at the end. Um, so two things, right? First of all, we need to like move these things in, in uh, Z in order to sort of have an exploded axon, right? We have three different systems here. We have Structural ribs going in one direction, structural ribs going in the other direction, so the U's versus the V's. And then we have the components themselves that lay on top of the structure, right? So we can think about those three layers as being something that we need to be able to select and pull apart um, vertically in order to frame and, and start to, to really understand what our axon looks like. 
The other thing is that these things are like surface thin. They have no thickness to them. And so we need to offset these into solids to give them some thickness um, if we want it to really look, look correct, right? All right, so let's move things first. How's that sound? I was careful in that, you know, first of all, the rhino, the rhino script put the V strips on the separate layer from the U strips. And then I also, when I baked my, my shading components, I put those on their own la layer. So I can just go into the layers here. I'm just gonna zoom out a bit in my, my views, especially my side views and my perspective view. I'm just gonna, let's say, uh, right click on the V strips and say, select all the objects on the V strips layer. Right. That way I can just sort of move these downward. Okay. I'll just move them down for now. I'm not sure how much. So it said I moved them about 117. I'm going to undo that and I'm going to move them precisely like 120 or something that I'll remember. Oh, no, I guess not. I take that back. 12, 15. Yeah, okay, I'll move it 15 units in this case. Not sure what the scale is here, but okay. The only reason I wanna, I'm doing that is I'm, I'm sort of noticing, you know, right around the range I wanna move this. And so making it a precise number so I can move the, the scales here, the, the constraining components upwards the same increment. Um, it's just, again, I'm just really anal about these things. It is what it is. Select objects for myself, panels, my component tree, I'm gonna move those up, I think 15. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that looks good. Do, do, do. Wait, sorry. I didn't unselect the ones before. Cell panels, there we go, select objects. Now I will move those 15, like I promised. All right, there we are. Okay. That might work just fine, I don't know. If, if not, I'll move them around a little more later. Um, right now, you can also see we're in perspective view. That's no good, right? Technically, technically, all of these, like, you know, go to vanishing points off in the distance and things that are larger um, or things that are closer appear larger, things that are further away appear, appear smaller. I want an axon, I want an isometric drawing. So I'm gonna right click on that label, the viewport label, perspective in this case, set view, go to isometric. In this case, I think it works out to a Northwest isometric. Now this is set to parallel. So everything's true scale. Um, just like if we were looking at it inside or top view, right? I'm just gonna position it. I think by default it puts these as 30-30 axons. Just gonna position it so that we can see a majority of the stuff better, right? So I don't have too many overlaps or anything between the different layers. And that I can at least make out the different parts as I go around. And then we'll talk about this. We're always going to include, occlude some of these components over here on the back side of this. And so I'll, I'll, we'll talk about this when it comes to the catalog along the side here later, as far as how we can sort of make this really sort of clear. But what I'm trying to do is I'm really just trying to position this so I have, first of all, a parallel axonometric drawing. And then I'm just ever so slightly adjusting, you know, adjusting it away from a 30-30 just so I can, I can get everything in, the, uh, in view here um, without, crazy overlaps, right? So I have a gap here between each layer. And that is really darn handy, I think. Okay. So um, now that I have that, um, I'm gonna do a couple of things here. One, I'm going to do a make 2D of this stuff. And then two, I'm going to render it out um, as a white clay model, just in case I wanna have the a slightly um, toned, uh, just very, very low key, um, tone, tone rendering underneath the, the line drawing and on the white page. So um, first and foremost, I'll go ahead and do the make 2D. I'll type that in. That's literally the command, make 2D, as you can see in the command line here. I'll go ahead and select all this stuff and right click. These, uh, these settings are really important. Um, if you don't have Rhino 6 at home, try to get your hands on a computer that does have Rhino 6, even if it's just temporary. Um, because you can use the scene silhouette viewport rectangle. I'll leave the tangent lines on. I don't know how important those are or not. Um, I'm going to turn off hidden lines. That's just way too much information. I more information than I ever wanted to know. I'm going to hit OK. 
And this is gonna draw this axon for me now, flattened out on the xy plane in our model. It says it's done, took 4.09 seconds. There it is, it's flattened out. And what's nice is that it put these all in different layers. So we have a, um, a visible lines layer, we have the scene silhouette layer, we have the, um, the, the viewport uh, outline layer, et cetera. Okay. Now, without changing my vantage point at all, without changing this view, this axon view, um, I wanna go ahead to my render settings. And those are usually on in here, right? Properties, layers, render settings, materials. Render settings. I'm just gonna make sure this is set to the current viewport. I'm gonna leave my DPI at 72 and quality at draft quality. Um, I will give it a transparent background. So I'll save this as a PNG. I'm gonna turn off the ground plane. And I'm gonna make sure the sun is off, but the skylight is on, right? I just want some soft shadows. I just want some tone. And you know, I, I don't even want this to be to be too, uh, you know, I want this to be pretty low key, um, just sort of underlay uh, below my line drawing. So, okay, once I'm done with that, I'm gonna hit, go ahead and hit render. This shouldn't take too long. It'll take longer than four seconds, but, but it shouldn't take too long. There we are, it's going. Oh yeah, look at that. Ah, just like I planned it. Okay, once this is done, I'll go ahead and save it. This little, you guys remember these floppy disks or were those before your time entirely? They, they actually stored 1.4 megabytes of information on them. They were the greatest thing since sliced bread. All right, I'm gonna save files type PNG, Portable Network Graphics. That will preserve the alpha channel transparent background for me. If I save it as a JPEG by accident, guess what? The background's gonna to turn to white or black or something like that. It'll be flattened and you won't have a transparent background anymore. I wanted the transparent background in my case. Um, that was a feature, not a bug, and so I wanna save as a PNG. Um, I will call this Exploded Axon 02, not to replace the Exploded Axon 01 that I made earlier, there we go. And I will let that save. I'll go ahead and close it once it's done. Let me go back to top view and I'll go to this make 2D. I'll go ahead and select everything. I'm gonna say export selected. This is the line drawing that it made for me. And I'll call this exported X on O2.ai. What I'm doing is I'm exporting this as a native illustrator file. So go down here to, this, to the type of file to save as. And um, just a little ways down, it's alph alphanumeric after you get past the Rhino versions. Um, so, uh, you know, one, two, three, four down, you get to Adobe Illustrator.ai. Go ahead and hit save. Snapshot of current view, that's fine. RGB, that's fine. I'll hit okay. All right. Now I'm gonna switch gears and go back to Illustrator. I'd like to keep these two apps open simultaneously a lot. All right, so over here is our template that we made. And so I'm going to open up also, in addition, this exploded Axon Illustrator file that I just exported out of Rhino. I literally just exported this. I'll open that up, right? That's a new file. Like you can see all the files I have open in Illustrator up here with tabs. Okay, just like with Photoshop. Um, really interesting, right? Really important to remember. This is not at the right scale. It doesn't have the right line weights or anything and not the right line colors either. I'm not gonna leave this as magenta, obviously. Um, but if I select all this stuff, I can, I can copy and paste it. But one thing I wanna make sure and make, be clear of is you look at the layers and you make sure that we have preserved the layers, right? That's really important that we can, um, let's say, select the viewport rectangle versus all the visible curves versus the scene select curves, okay? To me, that's super important. And we're gonna copy and paste this from this document into our, our template. Always go to that layers box, go to its settings, and double check and make sure that paste remembers layers is checkmarked, okay? Otherwise, when you copy and paste, you'll paste into just everything into one silly generic layer. Um, this will remember that everything is on its own specific layer and it will translate those layers back over to the, the document that we paste into, okay? So make sure that's checkmarked, that's really super important. I'll go ahead and select everything, Control C to copy and Control V to paste. All right, now we made this to 24 by 24. So I'm, I have this whole drawing selected. 
I'm just gonna go up here to the height. I'm just gonna type in 24. I want it to be 24 inches in height. Now I can try to line this up. The top edge there should line up with the top edge here. Let's see. So I'm gonna, in the Y direction, where a Y coordinate, I'm gonna give it a zero. There we are. I'm just gonna move it over in the X. Let's see where this ends up here. Negative 17. So I'm just gonna take that, I'm just gonna straighten it out to negative 17. There we are. All right. So um, what I did is I positioned this so that it's 17, or sorry, it's 24 inches tall by whatever wide, I don't really care. Um, and, uh, and then this corner is at negative 17 um, in Y, in, in the X, in zero in Y, all right? Because if I know that, then when I place this, uh, this, um, this exploded axon.png, this rendering file, right? I can do the exact same things. I can change its height to 24 inches. And I could tell it I want its top left corner to be at negative 17 and zero. And now it matches up precisely. Now this is actually um, on, this, on the layer up here. I wanna create a new layer. I'm gonna move that all the way down to the bottom, layer six. I'm gonna make sure that this rendering is selected and I'm gonna move it into layer six. So now it's at the bottom. Right, remember these layers are like pieces of trace paper. The layers at the top are the, like the pieces of trace paper on top of the things below them, right? So um, this is like the order of the, the sort of stack, okay? Um, now, I, now that I have that positioned, I can go ahead and lock it so I don't accidentally move it. Um, I can get rid of this viewport rectangle layer, maybe just turn it off for now, right? And from here, let's see. So I have a grid, one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm taking up, 12 inches, right? So half of the board, right? Because it's 24 inches wide. And I, so I just want to make sure that this margin here is roughly the same as this margin here. It really is. I'm so smart. Gosh, sometimes it hurts to be this gangsta-like. So anywho, I'm going to now go ahead and go through these layers and select um, particular layers at different times and start to adjust line weights and line colors. So visible curves, I'll go ahead and select those. I will make sure I have the stroke selected over here in my palette. Go to colors and I'm gonna go ahead and change these to black. And I'm gonna go ahead and change the line weight to something like 0.75. This will differ depending on your tastes as well as the size of things. So I'll do the same thing with the tangent curves. I don't know if we even have any of those. Looks like we have a few. And I just wanna make sure that those are the same, 0.75. And make sure that those are all set to the same. Um, CMYK black where K is 100 and all the others are zero. All right. And then last, I have scene silhouette curves. I'll go ahead and select those. Make sure those are all set to black as well. And I'll change them to the same uh, line weight. Now, here's the thing, right? The scene silhouette is not perfect. You can see it got some of this silhouette, but it didn't get other parts of it for some silly reason. And then it got all of these in, you know, really complicated inside parts, like, you know, but so I might have to go back around an illustrator just add a few, right? Like it looks like right here it stopped and I just need to sort of go back through and add a couple of um, one point um, lines throughout. But, or it could just be my uh, an optical illusion, I'm not sure, right? Uh, but, but make sure that, you know, if you're, you're confused by this, then just, you know, show me an example and I can always look at it with you and uh, we can troubleshoot some things, okay? Um, but the idea is that you're making a really nice, super elaborate, um, exploded axon drawing here, right? Um, and so, you know, there's a few other things I might do. You know, there's a layer one here, it's above the bitmap layer. Um, there's really nothing on this layer one. I'm gonna go ahead and, and start, I'll turn, lock all the other layers. Yeah, there we go. Layer one, I'm just gonna just ever so slightly try to make a couple of vertical lines through the, oh, through this. I'm gonna just use this light dashed lines just to sort of show the projection the vertical projection through a couple of these common corners here. Somewhere, there we are. Da -da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. We have a corner right here too, look at that. Mm -hmm. All right. Those have absolutely no fill. They're or 
so no color to them. So I'm gonna go ahead and make sure I select them, get that stroke color selected. I'll turn those to black. These are gonna be light lines. I'll turn them to 0.25 and I'll give them a dash. Let's see what that dash looks like. That's a 12 point dash. Eh, we could do better than that. I don't know. Maybe 0.5. I'll increase the density here. Maybe four and two. Let's see what that looks like. And maybe that's a bit small. Six and six. How does that sound? Oh yeah. No, that's that's one really good line weight. All right, anyway. I mean, come on. Dash gaps. That's like the craft of architecture right there. Like when you when you can just like screw around with those proportions, it's it's a good day. Let's see, hide the rulers. You can always toggle the guides on and off. Sometimes they're they're really handy to have. I can always hide them real quick. But sometimes it's really nice just to sort of see things without them for a moment and just take a look, right? Here we are. There's an exploded axon, at least the start of one. All right. A couple of other things we're going to add to our inventory here. We need to have a catalog of the sort of parts. And so I'm going to take the flattened out version and grid of these components, right? In fact, we can't even see all the components on here. So I'm going to go ahead and lay them all out here nice in a nice flat grid. I'm going to show all the ribs in the U and the ribs in the V laid out as well, flattened. And I'll, I'll make sure that I reformat some labels and then I'll start to add labels over here. All right, so um, let's do that. Why not? Yeah, I'm gonna move this out of the way. The reason I'm doing that is because I just happen to know that I've situated a bunch of laser, compon laser cutting components um, right around this uh, positive X, positive Y quadrant. And this just laid down on that positive X, positive Y quadrant. I just wanna move it away so I don't accidentally have too many things overlapping. I can't select anything. That'd be tragic, wouldn't it? All right, um, make 2D. I'll just turn all that crap off or stuff off. There we are. Yeah, there we are. View cuts, cell panels. All right, here are my ribs. Oh yeah, look at those. I'll just go ahead and export those. I'll probably relay them out in a little, little better um, so that it's more clear like which is which. Um, these I think we're just trying to situate them on the, on the, the board for laser cutting at some point. So go ahead and um, export selected those and I'll export those as Illustrator files as well. So I'll just call this um, rib layout. All right, I'll turn those off. And I'll turn on my component grid cutting, like grid scoring. Yeah, look at those. Oh, those are so nice looking. Mm -mm. Those are great. I'll um, export those as well. Export selected. Wait, yeah, let me select them. There we go. Now I can export because I have something selected. There we go. All right, and I'll call these uh, grid, gridded component layout or something like that. I don't know. Um, same thing. I'm just going to leave this as default and hit OK. All righty. Whoop, whoop. And um, I can open up those Illustrator files and I'll copy and paste from them as well. So where's the rib layout? I might sort of selectively move some things around before I, I move these into the, and I copy and paste them. Let me look at this. This is really important. I, I want to get these components in here. Yeah, sure, whatever. Don't care. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste these. Copy, control C, paste, control V. All right, I'll move these in. I'm just going to scale them. Really important, I think, that we see all of these laid out really nicely like that. Now, I think what you'll find is that these text labels are awful looking. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. One of the things I'm going to do, uh, maybe, is try to select them. I should have put the text all in a different layer. Oh no. Okay, no, it is what it is. I'm just gonna quickly, what I was gonna do is move this text out of the way so that there's sort of like, almost like a, um, a caption underneath each piece, right? Um, and if I could select them all at the same time, man, would that be easy, right? Um, so let me just take a look at that. It's worth, it's worth it, right? I mean, I think it's worth it. Yeah, sorry. All right. This document contains artwork that may slow down saving the recovery information. Data recovery. Who cares? What? 
Thank you, uh, illustrator, for nothing. Um, so I'll call this uh, template test02. I'll just save this file, I think is what it's trying to tell me. All right. There we go. Yeah. Save will continue in background. What's wrong? It's not like this is a lot of information, illustrator. No, no, my computer's been acting weird. Computer grid cutting. All right, here we go. I'm going to select all the through cuts and I'm just going to double check those. I'll turn those down to 0.75 line weight. Um, for the scoring, I'm going to do the same. Open that up, make sure they're black, turn those down to 0.25 or something light like that. 2.25 might be a little too light. I don't know. No, that looks good. That's fine. Yeah, just a little score line there. All right. Last but not least, I have these labels. I should have baked these on their own layer so I could just select them all at once in one click of a button. And I didn't. We call that pulling a Josh. It happens sometimes, especially on Mondays. Especially on cold wintry days. I went outside and I, I thought maybe it snowed or something. It was that cold. I thought I got lost in Canada while I was sleeping. It's me. Freaking ridiculous. You know, I really, really just would love to move these out of the way. I'm actually manually selecting each one of these one by one. How, how committed is that? Uh, always think a couple steps ahead. Work smarter, not harder, Josh. You know what I'm going to do? because <laughs> I might accidentally unselect these. Uh, I'll move them manually to a different, new different layer here. There we go. That would be a good idea as well. That way, in case I want to keep adjusting them and bumping them around, I can. I'll call this labels. It's definitely, it, it, see, I like sweater weather, but, but golly, like sweater weather was like 70s, not like 30s, 40s, yeesh. You know what I mean? Oh. So depressing, anyway. Sweater weather, sweater. Why is it not letting me, oh. Yeah, see, I would have made that tragic mistake and then I would have to do all this back over again. All right, how are we doing on time, 10, four? Okay, so we have plenty of time, all right. This won't take too much longer, I don't think. There's actually an easier way to do this. Can you select all text? Select zone, ta -ta 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 -ta. all text objects. Oh, come on, really? All right, well, at least I figured that out before I got halfway through. All right, yeah, I could do it with one touch of a button. Golly, I think 50 is a good spot for sweaters. Yeah. You know, part of it I think is just, it's so, it's like the wind is like frigid, right? You know, the wind goes a long ways in sort of making things really disgustingly cold. Um, all right. You know, a couple of things I noticed, first of all, these aren't quite aligned. So I'm just gonna go ahead and select just a row. This is where these, have you guys seen this? The align and distribute objects? I can align them so that they're all justified to the bottom. Oh yeah, look at that. All right. I mean, you know, if you're like super into this like I am, where everything you do has to be perfect, or you just don't show it to anybody ever, then, uh, then yeah. You know, I think what we need is more, more people who have a lot of attention to detail. It's, it's always a good, always a good set of skills here. All right. Almost there. Man, this project's almost so, so fun. I, I kind of want to, I could do this instead of like, what I have to do for work. Ugh. I used to do this kind of stuff for a firm. Let's see, let's move those up a bit. There we are. Yeah, right, not, oh yeah, that's, those are so good looking. Now the key thing I think is that, you know, you need to figure, sort of figure out a way to sort of point out the fact that um, in actuality, right? This corner is, is this corner, and this corner is that corner, or whatever, right? So 
you know, whether you do that with a set of labels or you do it with a set of leaders that sort of at least talk about the certain corners, um, that's up to you. I, I will tell you for like ribs and, and the sort of three dimensional version of these, you know, I just like to make a sort of nice legible, oh, not that. I don't know why I like circles. This is like the one time I actually like circles. I like to make a nice legible, that's too large. Let's see, how big is that? I can select it and I can always go up here. Maybe I'll make it 0.5 inches, so half an inch, right? Um, and I'm going to give that more thickness, like a one, but then I'm gonna turn it down so it's not black. Turn it down to like 60% or something, like a gray. Maybe more than that later, I don't know, we'll see. Um, Lorem Ipsum, all right. Otherwise known as Adobe Latin. All right, so Myriad Pro, I, I hate Myriad Pro. I'll be honest with you. You guys might like Myriad or, or what's the other one um, that, uh, that, that Microsoft uses, it's, it's terrible. Um, Arial, Helvetica, Times New Roman, those are, those are classics. I'd say go with one of those. I like Helvetica, why not? Um, Calibri, Calibri is the worst. The M's, the, the outside of the M's on Calibri are not straight. They're like, they, they sort of slant out. That just bugs the crap out of me every time. Come on, Microsoft. Use your market share for good, not evil. Just once, you know, that sort of thing. All right, anyway. That doesn't bug you guys? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Call me crazy. You guys already have. You guys are judging me. That's cool. I don't care. What up? Turn that down as well. But you know, <laughs> so we can use papyrus then. Oh no. Oh, comic sans, wingdings, no. My ears are bleeding. Oh. Okay. All right. Um, but you know, you could always do something, you know, this still looks kind of large and awkwardly large. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll tone that down a bit. 18 is a good size for a font. Let's see. Almost like if you ever work at a firm and you, you had diamonds and hexagons and circles for, for labels, right? Um, you know, you could do that here um, where you could say, okay, this is A. And this one's B. Oh, not Z, B, there we go. Yeah. All right, I'll try to act a little smarter here. Come on, keyboard, C. All right. Et cetera, right? I could go around this whole thing if I wanted to. And in fact, I probably would. In fact, I'd probably be better off doing it over here, right? So maybe this starts off as A. B. I don't think these are quite lined up. That's gonna bug the crap out of me, but you know, it's not the first thing to bug me forever. I'm obsessive compulsive and I'm also a procrastinator and those two things just do not work together. D, E, and F, get rid of that A. Just copy and paste away, right? Um, yeah, there we go, some more copy and paste. Oh, come on. Really? Move. I don't know why it's not letting me move that. Just use my keyboard. Take that. All right. What is going? Oh, I see. <laughs> That's weird. What a weird cursor. I don't even know what cursor mode that was. I don't really care either because I don't ever want to use it again. A stupid cursor mode. All right. I, G, H, I, and so on, right? So I could go through and, you know, of course, I would probably straighten these up a bit. And it looks like I don't have enough room down here at the bottom, so I need to resize a few things as I go, right? But I could begin to sort of add labels to these tagging, tagging these things. Let me give it a slight leader. In this case, I have that as a line. I'll just use the eyedropper tool and make it the same attributes as my circle. So same line thickness, same, um, 
same color. I'll just click, 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 click. So maybe I have the alphabet going in one direction for the ribs and the numbers going in the other direction or something. Okay. Obviously I ran out of space down here and that's not ideal at all. So I'd wanna make sure I have more margin down here so I actually have room. That's just poor planning on my part. Let's see here. Okay. Ten forty-eight. Man, is it me or is like today just creeping by? I figured it was like noon already, and you guys were just sticking around because you're that committed. All right. Let's bring in the ribs. Oh, I promised I would lay, relay out the ribs really quickly. Yes, let's do that. That would help. Certainly couldn't hurt, that's for sure. So these look like they go really like over here. These are, these, these are like that way, right? Interesting, yes. All right, mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, let's move these. I think that's an interesting thing about a Pringle. It's, you know, my, Mathematical Pringle was um, was uh, uh, symmetrical. <laughs> yeah. So, anywho, um, go ahead and copy and paste these in. Copy. Again, go to the layers. Make sure the settings is set. Paste remembers layers. That really helps you out a lot. Let's see. Where are we? There we are. All right. And I will turn these on. I'll go ahead and blow these up as well. That would help. Obviously, they're not going to stay just like that. A couple of things I'm going to do here. I'm going to turn my grids back on, my guides, sorry, show guides. And I remember you can toggle things on and off in the view, pull down menu. You can toggle your rulers on. You can toggle your guides on. You can lock your guides, hide your guides, release your guides. Hide your kids, hide your wife. All right. So. Cell panel scoring, all right. Through cut, labels, labels. Yep, labels, cool. Go ahead and lock the labels thing here. Through cut, Let's see what do we have there? All right, let me go ahead and select these one more time here. And uh, let's change their line weight, something much smaller. Point, actually I've been using 0.75, haven't I? Yeah, I have. All right. And I don't know, are these on the same layer? Cell panel scoring layer. Huh, interesting. I didn't expect that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select everything that's this same color. Select same stroke color. Oh, yeah. I'm going to turn these to black, first of all. So they're not going to be like John Deere green anymore. Um, black and uh, actually, I'm going to turn them down a little bit. I'm going to turn them down to like 70. And I'm going to decrease their line weight significantly, like 0.25 or something, right? If I keep them, but I'll keep them for now, uh, either way. Um, now I'll go ahead and, and uh, select all the rest of the ribs, all these red ribs. Um, I'll turn those to 0.75. Yep. And I'll turn those to black as well. So. Yes, yes. All right. I'm just going to go ahead and select these really quickly. Hopefully, you got them all. I'll line them up here. Give them a little more space. You know what I could do? Oh, yeah. I think I will do that. Sorry, I'm thinking out loud. I'm going to pull these away from each other for just a moment. You know, it just occurs to me, like, you know, if these line up with, if these are these, then what I can do is I can turn them this way. I'll, I might, like, rearrange these a little bit, you know, to make them sort of align a little better. Um, let's see if I have room down here now. I don't. So I'm just going to leave a little bit of a space there. And just select them all at once, and I'll just shrink them down a bit. From here, it's just a matter of being patient, right? Um, look, I have a 
a vocabulary for labeling things. Maybe I relabel these now accordingly, right? So this would be A and B and C and D all the way through. Um, in which case I could get rid of these. You know, they're, they're pretty junky looking anyway. I mean, you know, the thought was there, but execution, not so much. Sound effects, of course, are optional as you blow these things away. All right, uh, let's see, those are all gone. And so now I can begin to move these independently. And um, in fact, one thing I could try to do is line them up the bottoms again. Look at that, in one fell swoop. Ha <laughs> ha, I love it. I love it when I can automate things and my laptop does the hard work for me or the repetitive work, not really hard, right? I mean, um, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this over to the side where I want it to be the furthest. There we are. I'll select all these things together. I'm gonna say distribute, it, distribute them equally. Let's see, distribute objects, vertical, distribute. There we are. Oh yeah. Mm -mm. Excellent, excellent. All right, I can do the same thing over here, right? Um, in fact, I'd probably add labels, you know, maybe I just take this thing and um, actually I think I've locked that layer, haven't I? So I'd probably put them on the same layer, labels, that'd probably help. And in fact, I could just copy and paste these once I have them, instead of having to retype a bunch of stuff. Um, here we are, copy and paste. And, um, Let's see, distribute, yes, smash. I just need to relay these out again. Obviously they're in a, the wrong order. There's a eye somewhere over here, right? A weird looking eye. All right, there we go. C. You could sing the alphabet song while you do this if you wanted to. I don't know why you'd want to, but it is what it is. E, F, maybe if you need to remind yourself. You ever do that? You're like halfway through the alphabet and you're like, wait, what comes next? I can't remember. You have to sing the song. Is that just me? Oh gosh, all right. Can't believe I said that out loud. Um, so now I have a basic set of components like a catalog. Um, the ribs are the same size, right? Components, those might actually get a little smaller. Um, but uh, almost out of room here. I gotta find some room for one more thing, right? And that is my, my, um, my uh, what do you call it? The uh, false color map, right? You guys remember what I'm talking about? That mesh with the, the red to blue or whatever it was? Yeah, all right. I'm not exactly sure what I wanna do with that I thought about maybe putting it in part of the explored axon, maybe as a fourth sort of system that gets pulled apart. Right? Um, or it could be a separate diagram that's smaller down here somewhere. But I need to clear some space for it, that's for sure. Right now I have inadequate room. And I suppose I have some space over here if I really wanted to do that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, let me give that some thought. I wouldn't be opposed to either one, right? So I think option A would be to have, instead of three layers, a fourth layer, right? Somewhere maybe even between the ribs and the, the components where you've actually rendered that mesh as well. And, uh, and so instead of having one, two, three, ribs, ribs, and components, you'd have four. You'd have ribs, ribs, um, the colored mesh, and then the components, right? As a sort of exploded axon sandwich. Um, so that's one way of thinking about it. Or if you render it out, you could put it down here as a diagram somewhere where there's, a, where there's more space, okay? Um, I will, again, sort of prepare some examples for that um, on Wednesday when we meet. Um, but that, that, don't let that stop you from getting started here, okay? Um, especially if you, you, know, you have a couple of hours to spend on 367 between now and Wednesday. Um, you know, I would much, much rather that you guys have started something, you have a lot of pointed questions for me. Remember, Wednesday is a work day. Um, and so you will have a chance to just work and ask me questions as you go. 
um, and I can troubleshoot anything that uh, that pops up. Right? When it comes to that mesh from the Grasshopper script, you just have to bake it in the colored mesh. And then I think in order to get it to show up as colored, um, you can either, I, I think you, you just render it just like anything else. Um, so you just include that in the, the exploded thing, right? Make a 2D of it, and then when you render it, um, it should show up as the, the with the, the, the coloration, right? Um, I will double check that um, again for you guys between now and Wednesday as well. But I'm pretty sure that's how you can get up the mesh coloration to show up is if the vertices are colored um, and when you render it, those, that's a material. So um, it, it'll show up that way. Where do we get the ribs from? Yeah, the ribs are from the previous cutting, right? So again, you're, you're, you use the Rhino script to make the rib system, the structural system, and you use Grasshopper to make the components that sit on top to, to provide shading, right? So sort of, um, sort of skeleton and skin, right? Um, you know, just like any other building, that's typically how you approach these things, structure and, and envelope. Um, if a quick question about mass labeling and surface parts, is there a better way than labeling each individually? I thought that might have been mentioned in the last class, but didn't figure find out. I try to I try to label each one individually. What do you mean? If each one's different, then you want to have a label on it. Is that what you're asking, Christian? No, no. What I'm can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. What I was mentioning or what I'm asking is uh, in Ryan or in the Grasshopper. Is it possible to before I bake out all the parts to label them and then bake them out? So yeah, that there's um, the, the example file from I think it's week three or four, um, has labels, it makes labels and situates them on, the, on each component automatically. And those can be baked out as well. So it's in one of the template files? Yes, um, I guess okay. I'm sharing my screen, I'll show you right now. It's in the second YouTube video from week uh, three. Week three? Yeah. Yeah. So it's in the second video, it's the end part, minute, the eight. Yeah, it's um, this one, right? If yeah. you get look at this grasshopper graph, it, it's this one, joining and rolling and labeling VREPs. There's a YouTube video of it that's pre-made um, from like last year, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and then here's, a, here's a, a grasshopper graph if you want to look at it and see how it's done. Okay, it's a good question. Hey. Thank you. So it, you were asking like, do I have to do that manually, each one step by step by hand? No, um, there's a way to, to create a, it, essentially you're just creating a list of numbers and then you're assigning them to each one and populating the numbers on the screen in the, in the same grid location as the components. In shorthand, that's how it works. There's obviously a few more widgets than that in the grasshopper graph. All right. Like I said, I'll be adding 2.5 in here this week's Canvas now um, with this class recording, as well as um, the start of a the template that we just made in Illustrator with it as an example, okay? So uh, expect that at the uh, after class ends. They'll take a, sometimes it takes half an hour to 40 minutes or so for the Zoom video to transcode and then um, it's uploading to YouTube only takes a few seconds usually, but um, it, it takes a while to process so that it's actually available on YouTube to watch. So that's usually that's why it only takes, it takes usually at least half an hour to get these things posted for you, but after class, but they're, I've been pretty, pretty good about um, making sure I do that after each class each day. Um, let's see what else. Well, um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And I'm gonna stop the recording. <laughs>